Hallelujah. How are we doing tonight? Good. My gosh, it's so good to see so many of you out here tonight. So good. I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying this series as we started a few weeks ago. I had somebody come up to me recently and, and, and said, uh, just keep teaching the basics like you've been doing. Keep teaching the basics. You know, as a pastor, you, you get concerned sometimes. Like, you know, how many times can they teach the same thing? But, you know, there's always individuals in our midst that maybe are hearing stuff for the first time. Amen. Amen. And then there's those of us who have been around for a long time that we need to hear that again and get stirred up again. Amen. 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 Um, there's something a little bit off here tonight. I don't know if anybody knows what it is. And uh, yeah, um, so I'm not teaching until everybody comes and fills up these seats. Somebody come and fill up these seats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, when people see papers on seats, they think they're reserved. But if you remember, the paper was on your seat, too, where you sat. Anybody else? A couple more seats. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Okay. So, started the series a few weeks ago. Blessed assurance. We want to make sure. We want to have an assuredness of a few things in our lives. And, and this is the best time to do this now. Okay, we're, we're, we're finishing up, pretty soon finishing up this year. Can you believe how fast this year went by? I got fly, time flies when you're having fun, right? And now we're getting ready in, in just a short period of time. By the time you, you blink, we're going to be welcoming in this new year. Amen. But it's time for us to make sure that we're finishing strong. Amen. It's time for us to make sure that we're all on the same page. Yes. Amen. Amen. That, that was a little bit weaker. Uh, it's time for us to make sure that we're all on the same page. Amen. Okay, as far as our beliefs, as far as the, are we rock solid in what we claim we believe? Are our beliefs really lined up with the word of God? Okay, because you understand, that's what we're called to. We're called to walk according to the word. We're, we, 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 we kind of, we claim our salvation not based on who we are and not based on our opinions and not based on what we do and what good people we are. We base our salvation, biblically speaking, upon the word of God, upon all that Jesus has done for each and every one of us. Amen. And I, have, I just feel this heavy responsibility. I don't mean heavy, but, but kind of a deep responsibility. I don't mean heavy in a sense of a burden, although sometimes it can't come as a burden. Are we, are we teaching what we need to teach? Do we know what we need to know to make sure that if, God forbid, we were to take our last breath this night, that we would find ourselves in the presence of God. Amen. That's a, what good is we know all these other things in the word of God, all these other stories and these principles. And, and you know, we know what it says in Greek and we know what it says in Hebrew. What good is it if we're not sure of our salvation? Amen. And I want all of us to make sure that we know that we know that we know that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our life. Amen. Amen. And so the only way to do that is every once in a while, I got to go back to some of the basics. Now, we talked about... Um, the fact that the Word of God is where we find all of our answers. I, I want to keep nailing this point because it's something that uh, sometimes uh, we say that we believe it, but then when it comes down to nitty-gritty, I don't know what it is about us as human beings, we, we, we sometimes elevate our opinions above and beyond what the Word says. Amen. You know, everybody's your pal until you hit a scripture that they don't like. Okay, and so, well, I don't see it. It's got nothing to do with what you see it. The, way, the fact of the matter is, it's in black and white. Or unless it's Jesus speaking, then it's in red and white. Okay? And so, uh, we got to make sure that what we claim we believe is actually found in the Word. Because that's what's going to make the difference in our lives. And, and, and this is a battle. You understand? I don't know if you're really grasping this. This is a battle because we live in a culture and a society right now where everybody has an opinion and everybody thinks their opinion is what matters the most. Amen. And that's wonderful out in the world. But in, in, in the church, in the body of Christ, in the family of God, it can't be that way. Amen. It's got to be based on thus says the word of God. Amen? Because if you, if you shake that foundation... And if you remove that foundation, the whole building collapses. So please understand that. The Word of God is the final authority in our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 
Again, a little bit of a review here. All scripture, all scripture, all scripture is given by? Come on, follow with me here. All scripture is given by? inspiration of God, and we've been talking about this, that in the original language, it literally says, God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteous. Yes, the word of God should bring correction. Well, it just doesn't feel good. That's because correction is never comfortable. Understand that. Okay, but do not get trapped in that mindset that you're going to elevate your opinion Above the word of God, it will not work. Amen. Amen? Amen? Okay, so now watch. Verse 17 is the important part here. That the man or woman of God may be complete. And what else? Thoroughly. Come on, nice and loud. And thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, so without the word of God, we're incomplete. Without the word of God, we're not thoroughly equipped for every good work. Because when we try to accomplish things on, well, the way I see it does not have the same power that the Word of God has attached to it. Amen? So we're answering those questions. We answered last week, we talked, well, why do I need a Savior? We found out that according to the Bible, humans need a Savior because everyone is considered a sinner by nature, meaning we have all committed acts that go against God's perfect standards. And as a result, we're separated from God. And face his judgment. Therefore, a savior is necessary to reconcile us with God by taking on the punishment. He took on the punishment for our sins through sacrifice, allowing us to be forgiven and have a relationship with God. Amen. That's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can go home right now. Amen. Amen. You need a savior. I need a savior. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. What do you mean I need to be made right with God? Because we're, not, we're born into this world with, with sin on us, Amen. with sin in us. And back in the old church, we used to call it what? Original. original sin. Original sin. In other words, this is it. You're stamped with it. You come into this world. You're already on the path of a sinner. Okay? Don't look at me like that. I didn't invent the process. I'm just telling you what the book says. Okay? But the fact of the matter is we're born sinners. And we're heading on a path that is going away from God instead of going towards God. Man, you don't have to do a thing to go to hell. You just have to be born on your way to hell. Okay? Uh, we get to heaven. We'll, we'll sit around. We'll talk about it more. But this is just a fact. This is the way it is. Amen? amen. Everybody over here, amen? amen? Okay, good. All right. So we need a Savior. If I'm, if I'm heading on a wrong path, I need someone to rescue me. Amen? Amen. So we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, for this is true for everyone who believes, for everyone who believes, for everyone who believes. Did I say it's for everyone who believes? Okay. So there's the faith part. No matter who we are, for everyone has sinned, and we are all fall short of God's glorious standard. Okay. Verse 24 says, yet God in his grace, say thank God for the grace of God. Freely makes us right in his sight. He did this. This is important. How did he make us right? He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Amen? Amen. God has a plan. It's perfect. He's not going to change his mind about executing that plan. You have to change your mind about getting on his schedule Amen. and getting on the path that he has for you. Amen? Amen. And it's a good path. Amen. It's, it's a good path. Amen. It's satisfying, it brings contentment, it brings fulfillment, amen? It matters in eternity, it's a good plan. Turn to somebody and say, it's a good plan. plan. Amen. So, once we are saved, then we can participate in his plan. You can't participate in in his plan unsaved. Now, thank God for his goodness, thank God for his grace, because when you look back, and many of us in this room could, we could pass the mic around right now and testify to this, if you look back on your life, even before you knew him, you would see that he was drawing you. And little by little, little by little, he was bringing you on that path that eventually was going to bring you into his plan. Amen? Amen. That's his goodness. We didn't even realize it. We think we're doing our own thing, and God's got us on a track going, okay. But then there came a day where you had to make the decision. There came a day when you had to speak with your mouth what you believed in your heart, and that's when salvation became a reality to you. Amen? Thank God he made it that easy. 
Man's been trying to mess it up ever since. So who was the savior? Because our salvation revolves around a person, not a philosophy. I'm going to say it again. Our salvation revolves around a person, not a philosophy, listen closely, not a ritual or a set of rules, but around one central figure. And this is the one thing that separates Jesus from every other religious figure throughout history. Jesus claimed to be God come to earth in the flesh. And that's why you could talk about God all day long. You can go out in, into the world, talk about God. You can go walking on the boardwalk and talk about God. You can go to the supermarket and come up to somebody and talk about God. But mention the name of Jesus. And everybody gets freaked out. <laughs> Amen? Because as long as you just use that term God, people can fill their whatever God they think and they can fill that slot there. But as soon as you narrow it down, and you say the name of Jesus, Jesus. demons start to freak out. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's aggravate him. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. So what's so unique about our salvation? Listen, no other religion's God comes to live inside the believer. Did you get that? There's no other religion whose God comes to live inside a mortal human being. Only this one. Only this faith will produce that kind of a relationship. Only this word can produce that kind of result. Amen? So let's get into it. Who is Jesus? Oh, I know all this stuff. Well, good. And sit there and pray for me while I'm teaching it. <laughs> pray for the people around you who may not know 100%. Because there's people that are still looking for answers. You, you think Jesus is that shallow that you can absorb it all in a couple of quotes and a couple of verses? No, the vastness. My God, just think about that series we did a few months ago. I guess maybe it was back in the spring. About when we saw Jesus in, all over the Old Testament. He's there. He was there. Amen. Amen? Amen? Jesus, the one who eventually takes on this physical body, is born in Bethlehem, lives on this earth, flesh and blood and bone body, 100% God, 100% man, then goes to the cross as the ultimate sacrifice. You think you're going to understand him in one lifetime? No, no. We're going to learn so much when we get there. Who, let's look at, let's look, who is this Jesus? Let's look at what he said about himself, okay? You think we're going to learn some things? Yes. Yeah, come on. Because, you, know, uh, you know, I love social media in one sense because it's a powerful way to spread the gospel, but it's also a powerful insight to how stupid some people are. Amen. And the ridiculous claims that individuals make and have no idea what the heck they're talking about. Jesus encountered a woman at the well in Samaria. You guys remember the story? Yes. He surprised her with a very deep conversation, which she was not expecting. John chapter 4, verse 16. Can't read the whole thing. We're going to start in verse 16. Jesus, now they're at the well in Samaria. He's asked her for a drink of water. She questions, why are you asking me for a drink of water? Because I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. Jews are not supposed to have anything to do with the Samaritans. And that's a 600-year history she was referring to. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. And that you spoke truly. Don't you love when God just nails you? <laughs> Don't you love when you go to church and you think nobody knows what's going on in your life, and all of a sudden, man, something happens, and you go, oh, Lord Jesus. Wow. I remember one time, and just tell you a brief story. Because this stuff, it sneak, even the person that's used by God, it sneaks up on. Many, many years ago, dear God, this had to be, let me see, the ministry here, the church is 27 years old. A couple of years before that, 28, 29, 30, 31, probably 31, 32 years ago. In the church, a little cat, cat uh, um, Pam, you were there that night, I believe. Tom, I think you were, Pastor Tom, I think you were, Pastor Pam, I think you were there. It was on a Friday night, you remember? And you remember the Victory in Jesus meetings on Friday night? You remember that? 
Okay. So, so I got asked to come and minister back then because they felt sorry for me and they let me come and preach once in a while. And so there's one Friday night, I don't forget. Now, this, this ministry was specifically for people that were coming out of like halfway houses. Okay, most of the people had been in prison or, or had really heavy drug problems. And so we'd have a special... Now, now, this wasn't when I was pastoring. I was in another person's church. Well, it was Jesus' church, but it was another group of people. And so there's one Friday night, I don't remember what I was ministering on, but I think you were there. And I had a bunch of people come up for prayer. People come up for prayer. And uh, I'm, I'm walking past this aisle, uh, past the lane of people here, uh, and I'm laying hands on people, and I stood in front of one person, and uh, I could see her face right now. I can't remember her name. I could see her face, a short, really thin, scrawny woman. And uh, as soon as I put my hand on her shoulder, the Spirit of God says she's got a hole in her heart. Pray for that. Pray for that. Okay? And I, and I stopped, and I went, you, just, you went to the doctor. The doctor told you you have a hole in your heart. No, I'm not telling you this to look at me. Look at me. I was more surprised than she was. Okay? Because that's what happens. When God uses you, you don't realize God's using you until after. You go look back, and you go, oh, my God, that was God. So, so now I'm like, oh, wow. The gifts of the Spirit are starting to operate. Okay, that's the supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit, right? Amen. Which is still alive today. Amen. Okay, don't believe people that tell you that doesn't happen. It doesn't, ha- doesn't happen because it doesn't happen to them. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So I stand next to the next person. I stand in front of the next person. I'll never forget. I, n- I remember his name. I'm not going to say it. The person's not here. I don't even know if he's still on the earth anymore. But he looked like a uh, leprechaun. Green uh, pants, green velvet, like velour, remember velour jackets? Bright velour green jacket. And he was a little guy. So I stand and I pray for him and I start moving off and then I come back and I would have never, if I thought of it, that's I would never say. And I said, by the way, the spirit of God says, stop looking at those magazines. You got no business looking at them. And he went like this and I went like this myself, like... (laughs) Now, was that done to embarrass the person? No. Did Jesus do this to embarrass this woman? No. But it got her attention, right? Yes. The Spirit of God will do that to get you. And when it's genuine from the Spirit of God, it doesn't rob your dignity. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yes. We should welcome when God wants to jerk the slack out of us. Yes. Now, this woman became a believer because Jesus began to manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Okay? You, are you getting this? Yes. That's the mercy of God. Now watch what happens here. Look what happens. He says to her, go get your husband. She said, I don't have any husband. He goes, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the one that you got right now is not your husband. Okay? Verse 19. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. That was a nice way to get out of that. That was a nice way to get out of that. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. It's true. Remember Romans chapter 1? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then also for the Greek. In other words, a non-Jewish person. So, so what he was saying to her is 100% true. Okay? So, verse 23, but the hour is coming, and that is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in what? Spirit and truth. Now watch this, verse 25. What are we talking about here? What did Jesus say about himself? The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who was called Christ, because you realize Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, anointed one, okay? When he comes, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, say it nice and loud with me. One, two, three. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. You getting that? No, no beating around the bush. No hesitation. He told her exactly who he was, the long-awaited Messiah. So who was Jesus? Who was the Savior? The Messiah. Messiah. Oh, well, he's the Messiah for the Jews. No, he's the Messiah for the whole world. Okay? He's the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. You got that one? Again, what are we talking about? Who is this Jesus? What did he say about himself? You getting this? 
John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Man, you could teach on that one. (laughs) My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Okay? And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Verse 30, you want to read it nice and loud with me? One, two, three. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. What's he talking about? The Trinity. Okay, so who did he say he was? He said he and the Father are one. So he's, he's equating himself with God, yes? Yes. Okay, you getting this? Yes. Okay, don't, get, don't sit there and go, well, I know this stuff. No, the Word of God is alive, and you can always get new, fresh revelation out of it Amen. if you want it, okay? All right, maybe, maybe they really didn't believe that, that maybe, maybe he really didn't believe that. Maybe he's just saying it. So, so let's look at the next verse. Okay, so now verse 30, let's repeat it again. One, two, three. I and my Father are one. So let's say, let's say maybe he just slipped. Maybe he, like, like the politicians say, we misspoke. Not, not lie, just misspoke, misspoke. Verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we did not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, look at what it says, make yourself God. So watch this now. They believed that he believed what he said about himself. Are you getting this? They believed that he believed. Now, we're, we're focusing on what he said about himself, right? So if, if they just blew it off and they didn't take him serious that he really believed this, would they have picked up stones to stone him? No, No, they would just went, this guy's a lunatic. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But when he spoke, he spoke with such conviction. They understood this man believes exactly what he just said about himself. Why? What's the evidence? They tried to kill him. They tried to kill him for blasphemy. Amen? So who, who did he say he was? He said he and the father are one. He's God. Okay? And they said, you make yourself out to be God. This answers the accusation that some people make, because you hear them all over, all over social media, these little uh, cell phone theologians. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. It's right here. What are you talking about? Jesus never claimed to be God. It's right here. Okay? John 14, 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Verse 6, you guys know this one. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You getting this? Yes. Jesus claimed equality with God the Father. Why? Because he is God in the flesh here on this earth. And he's the only way for you and I to receive salvation. Are you getting this? Yes. Now, some of you are sitting here going, oh, just be nice. It passes off on this tangent. No, no, you need to know these things. Why? Because you're going to run into people that are going to ask you these kind of questions. We live in a society right now that we've got people around us from all different backgrounds and coming from all different cultures and coming from all different religions. And you think think God is just allowing some of these people to come here just to come and sit around? 
Because where they come from in their nation, they can't get this information. So, so are you prepared? If a Muslim who's really searching for God but doesn't know any better finds out that you're supposed to be a Christian and that person has questions for you, do you know where to go to show them? Because what you don't understand is depending on which sect of Islam you're talking about, Muslims, the Quran itself tells them you need to believe what the Bible says. Now, a person that understands that from their own book, from their own Quran, okay, if you're then going to be able to show them a scripture that's in the New Testament about Jesus, they may receive that from you. But if you're sitting around going, well, I know all this stuff, and ho, 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 I know all this, I heard this when I was in Sunday school as a kid. But do you know how to put a, a plausible, do you know how to put together a viable answer? Amen. See, by us not preparing to give an answer, we're showing that we absolutely have no faith that God's ever going to want to use us to touch somebody else's life. Because if we understood that that's the case, we would prepare. Right. Are you getting this? Yes. We would prepare. You would get them under your belt. You'd be able to, you know, if somebody would touch you and these scriptures would pop out just like when you got a full sponge. When, you, when a sponge is saturated, but you just pick it up and it just drips. Yes or no? Or the only the sponge is in my house. I don't know. If you, if you just go like that and a sponge that's saturated, what happens? It comes out. That's what this is for. Let's get so saturated. Let's get so filled up with these scriptures that anybody comes close and goes, well, you know, I was listening to this video. I was watching this video, and this person had a pretty good argument. No, Jesus never claimed to be God. You go, yeah, what Bible are you reading? Because it's plain. It's right here. Are you listening? Or, oh, oh, so, oh, but maybe you don't care. Oh, maybe you don't care. Jesus claimed equality with God the Father. He is God in the flesh. And we can go on and on and on, but I figure let's go with two or three scriptures here. Let's talk about what others said about him, okay? Let's see what the Apostle John said about him. John chapter 1, verse 1. Sounds just like Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. So the Word was God. The Word is God. Yes or no? Yes. The Word is God? Yes. God is the Word. Yes. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see it? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. This is John speaking. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What did John say about Jesus? He was in the beginning. He is the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What's he saying? God is the Word. God came down, dwelled in flesh among us. Amen. Let's see what the Apostle Thomas said. Okay? You know Thomas? You remember Thomas' nickname? Yeah. The doubter. Okay? Well, Jesus took care of that. John chapter 20. Verse 26, eight days after the resurrection. Eight days. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. And you remember what, what Thomas said when he missed out on Jesus on resurrection afternoon? I won't believe it unless I could see his wounds, I could stick my hand in his side. Those were, those were Thomas's words. Jesus physically wasn't there when he said that, but here he comes, eight days later, here they are again. Thomas is there. Jesus shows up. Jesus came. The door's being shut. I, don't, I think John wrote that purposely to kind of like. Yeah. The door's being shut and stood in the midst and said to them, peace to you. Shalom aleichem. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. You talk about Jesus nailing you? <laughs> Tom, big shot. Come here, Thomas. Come here. Stick your finger in there. And look at my hands and reach your hand there and put it into my side. Oh, look at this. Man, I don't know what I would do if Jesus said that to me. 
Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Now he's talking about us. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We're more blessed because we've not seen him in the flesh. They saw him in the flesh and believed, and that's fine. But dear God, we haven't seen him in the flesh. We sense his presence. We know in our heart that he's alive. We hear his voice. He answers our prayers. But we've never seen him in the flesh, not yet. He said we're blessed. You're not, he said we're blessed. Let's see what the Apostle Paul said. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Oh, wow. I just realized what that's saying. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, on earth, here, visible and invisible. That means on, on earth here, there are things that are visible and there are things that are invisible. Just because we can't see it. He's telling us there's, there's another realm right alongside us. The realm of the spirit. It's not far away. Not far away. Amen. Then he goes on to tell us what they are, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Those are rankings of angels. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things consist. He's literally the glue that holds everything together. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the what? Preeminence. He needs to be first. It needs, our lives need to be all about him. Amen. 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 Let's see what the Apostle Peter said. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do, may, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 14, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So what does that tell us about what they believed back then? What does it tell us about how off they were and their beliefs? They either believe in reincarnation or they believed that somebody from the dead could come back and speak to us other than Jesus. You listening? Don't get caught up in either one of that foolishness. It's not of God. He corrects them, okay? He said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, or we could say it this way, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Who did Peter say he was? He is the Messiah. He is the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon the son of Jonah. Watch this now. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, you didn't get this on your own and in your own intelligence, but my Father who was in heaven. And today there are many voices in the world trying to tell us who Jesus is and trying to tell us who he is not. But the Bible is God revealing Jesus to us. He is who he said he is. He is who the disciples said he was. And that needs to get settled. But now let me ask you this question. They're going to wrap this up now. Who do you say he is? Who, who do you say he is? You got, to answer, you got to ask yourself that question. Who do you... Well, I come to church all the time. There's probably mice in this building that come to church all the time. <laughs> But you see what we do? You see what we want to put on the same par as believing in, in Jesus? Why well, come to church all the time? Hmm. 
Jesus said to them, who do you say I am? Because listen to me. There's a principle in the word of God. He cannot be to you who you do not declare him to be. You notice even through the, even through the gospels, you'll see people that, came, that Jesus came in contact with that called him good teacher, called him prophet. And what did that tell us about those individuals? They really didn't know who he was. That's why when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus went, okay, we got one here who's, who's getting close here. That's why he said to him, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my father who was in heaven revealed this to you. You getting this? So, so I'm asking again, and I'm not just doing this to just be cliche-ish. Who do you say he is? My comfort, my strength. Who is he? Is he your savior? Well, I, I just believe Jesus is a good man. A good man doesn't get you to heaven. Now, well, I believe that he's my savior. Okay, okay. But do you understand what's contained in that title of savior? Not just somebody who's going to cause you to skip hell. That word salvation in the New Testament covers every aspect of life, spirit, soul, and body. He's healer. He's deliverer. He's our righteousness. He's our victory. He's our, our redeemer. He's the glory and the lifter of our head. He is our comforter. He is our shepherd. He is the soon coming king. But he can only, you will only get the revelation of who he is in proportion to who you declare him to be. And not just saying it, but actually having it come out from here. Like, I'll guarantee you, Peter was the most surprised guy when that came out of his mouth. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He probably went, who said that? Because it came as revelation. He didn't put two and two together and went, oh, you must be the one. Are you getting this? So, so take an inventory as we wrap this up tonight. Take an inventory for yourself. Who do I really believe him to be? Who, when do I go to him? And in what situations and in what circumstances do I automatically, without even thinking, that I go to him? When sickness comes, do I automatically go to him? When I'm losing peace, do I automatically run to him? When, when, I, when I need provision, am I trying to work a scheme in my head or do I automatically go to him? You see what I'm saying? When I need guidance, am I going to six different people who are just as equally flawed as I am, or am I going automatically to him? Lord, you said I'm your sheep and I hear your voice, and you said that the voice of a stranger I will not follow. Shepherd, good shepherd, great shepherd of my soul, what direction do you have for me? He can only be who we declare him to be. There's a lot of people that went to hell that thought he was a good person, that thought he was a miracle worker, that thought he was a good teacher. There's major cults in the world today that so Jesus, we follow Jesus' teachings, but do you believe in who he said he was? And is he to you the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of this world? Amen. I can't answer that for you. You can't answer that for me. He can only be who we declare him to be. Stand up, everybody. Let's make this declaration, and we're going to close out for tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lift one hand up to the Lord right now and just say this with me. Father, Father in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus with, all of my heart, with all of my heart, I declare, I declare Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ is my Savior. I declare, I declare that he is the Son of God. I declare that he is the Lamb of God who came to take away my sin. I declare he is healer. I declare he is deliverer. I declare he is provider. I declare he is my peace. He's my joy. 
He's my righteousness. He's everything good to me. And I trust him with all of my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now listen to me real quick. Don't, don't, don't. I don't want to break this atmosphere. Listen to me. I am certain there are some of us in this room that made that declaration tonight for the first time. If this is the first time that you've declared from your heart with the words of your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior and you believe that in your heart, please do not walk out these doors. Come up here. It's important for you to tell somebody, I said that tonight for the first time. It's important that you, you tell somebody, I made that declaration tonight for the first time and I believe it with all my heart. Amen? Amen. Let him be all that he wants to be to you. But make sure what you're searching for him to be is found in the word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. God bless you. Those of you that need to come up here and make that, and tell somebody you made that declaration, please make your way up here. It's extremely important that you do that.